sure to write down what your topic was, happen to forget what your topic was. Okay, that is here for you to, uh, to access. All right, so if you need it, it's up here. For some reason you weren't here last week, okay, you can write down your topic. Um, when it comes to the quiz, a big chunk of it is on what we covered last week on both male and female reproductive systems. Okay. The last third of it is coming from what we're going to look at here today. All right. So what you guys are seeing here, and again, how I'm going with the order of the pages that I handed out to you, because again, those of you who just come in a little bit afterwards after I start talking, I didn't like your lab manual, so I went back to the old one and stole these pages. All right. I'm on page 348. And the reason why I kept 348 and I made a copy of it was because I did address this last week, but I didn't like the, the fact that the actual diagrams weren't in the book. So if you look here, it shows you the female sexual cycle collectively. It shows you how the ovarian cycle overlaps the menstrual cycle and how we kind of, we talked about these, we've definitely talked about the phases of the ovarian cycle, the follicular phase, and then the development of the follicle and how that is influenced by FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And then we see a surge of luteinizing hormone for ovulation of the bursting of the follicle, the release of the ovum, and this, the last phase here, then the luteal phase. Okay, I know we mentioned that. And we get to see how each of those, how those overlap, again, the phases of, this, uh, of the menstrual cycle, and how we'll see, a, again, a direct surge of estrogen in correlation to that luteinizing hormone. And then we also get to see the effects of progesterone. Okay. I bring it up because it's nice to know as far as some of these different things go as far as developmentally, all right? Um, one of the things that it's talking about at the bottom of this page is, um, is, is how these different hormones will have direct impact on that female sexual cycle. Uh, but again, I just, I think that charts are, are really nice, nicely done so that you guys can see it and have a better idea. Um, so that was kind of a reiteration of what we were covering last week. Right. Uh, if you turn to pa the page 353, On 353, and kind of have 353 and 354, it's talking about the state of human embryology. Okay. Even this old lab manual had some issues that I didn't like, but this, because it would like it would do things with starfishes and starfish embryos, and I was like, what the hell are we talking about? This is human AMP. I don't understand why we have to get into starfish. All right. But the reason why this becomes important, and when we talk about states of uh, of embryology, all right, is because we're seeing this aspect of development of, thank you, of all the tissues, and, and now we're starting to see really all the different primary organs that are going to sustain life. So my question for you guys is, when in prenatal development are we classified as an embryo? Mm. To pass it down through mm. before fertilization. Mm. Mm. After fertilization. Isn't it when it, it, when it adheres in the uterus? When it adheres in the uterus? Yeah. So I always tell my students, think of ballet. What do ballerinas wear? Tutu. Tutu. Two weeks to two months. Two weeks to eight weeks. Okay. Are we classified as an embryo? All right, and so, now again, we don't talk about things that way. When we talk about pregnancy, all right, we generally talk about pregnancy as what? Three trimesters. trimesters. Yeah. The first trimester, shh, don't tell anybody. Not supposed to let anybody know. Okay. And there's a reason why, because, this is that point where this developing embryo, soon to be a fetus, all right, is vulnerable. It's vulnerable to stress. It's vulnerable to drugs. And I'm not saying recreational drugs. I'm talking about prescription drugs. Okay, I'm talking about over-the-counter medications. Okay, vulnerable to alcohol. Vulnerable to all right, 
smoking, vulnerable to whatever we expose. And then, hey, there's this wonderful thing that we do to ourselves as human beings. It's this thing called stress. And none of you have any of that. Okay? And so developmentally, there's a reason why we don't talk about, all right, we're not quote unquote supposed to announce it yet until we know that the pregnancy itself has sustained past that first trimester. Because the odds go up greater that pregnancy is going to go to full term, all right, if we get through the first trimester. Not always the case? No, but again, the odds improve tremendously. So as we get into this, and what they're talking about in here, is in that state where we're classified as an embryo, that 2-2 two, two state, 2 weeks to 2 months, or 2 to 8 weeks, all right, we're going to see the development of what we refer to as three primary germ layers. Okay? Those of you who had me for AMP1 for lecture, we, I know we talk about this because we get into the three germ layers as far as how and what is derived from them. And that's what it's mentioning here. So if you have 353 and 354, it's talking about we have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. Okay. And what's coming from these layers, thank you. All right, what's coming from these layers, yep. all right, are what eventually is going to be the different organs and organ systems that make up the body. So the ectoderm, it's going to be the, the epidermis, okay, your entire outer layer, all right, as well as your nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord. Okay. And one of the things that we always talk about with young mothers, all right, as if expecting mothers to be, or even those who are trying, is we always recommend what? Prenatal. Prenatal, Prenatal vitamins. Again, because what we're talking about is, again, we said it's, it's vulnerable in this first trimester. It's vulnerable in this state as an embryo. And what we're seeing here is in this state, we have proper development of the neural tube. The neural tube is your future brain and spinal cord. Okay? And what that requires primarily and more specifically is folic acid, okay, a number of B vitamins. So if any of you in here, again, are thinking of having children or, you know, you can get on prenatal vitamins. They, sh they don't have any side effects besides maybe the fact that they're good for your hair and your nails. Uh, well, don't take it on an empty stomach, and I mean that's just, that's any vitamin you could really actually cause if if you had that you know that's that response. They um, really like, really. And and again, but what we were talking about with that, that might have been also some of the different hormonal changes as far as some of the things that are occurring and happening there as well. Um, but for the most part, really the only side effect of uh, of them is it actually does provide some nice strength to the hair and the nails. Um, and it's really, for the most part, a lot of them are B vitamins, which are water-soluble vitamins. So whatever your body doesn't absorb, you urinate, you excrete out. So it's not that big of a deal. All right. All right. So again, from the ectoderm, we're seeing here the epidermis, all right, the nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, the central nervous system. The mesoderm, okay, we're seeing connective tissue, we're seeing muscles, we're seeing bone, we're seeing blood and blood vessels, as well as the reproductive organs, the gonads. Okay. The endoderm, all right, notice it's developing to the bladder, okay, the lining of the digestive system, the lining of the different organs, some of these larger primary organs. Okay. Folks, I promise you on your quiz, there's going to be a, qu a question of what's derived from these germ layers. So make sure we know. Them. Cool. All right. So earlier on, I asked the question of when are we classified as an embryo? And again, we got the tutu. Okay. All right. and it was always interesting because I always like to see when, what people will say to this. And at the bottom of 354, they're showing you different stages of what's occurring all right, once fertilization has occurred. And again, we kind of talked about this last week, right? We said we have the sperm cell is a haploid, 23 chromosomes. All right, the egg cell, the ovum is a haploid, 23 chromosomes. They get together to form that diploid cell. 
Okay, 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. All right, and if you look at this, all right, it's showing you on the bottom of 354 these different steps. So at fertilization occurs, and it's talking about at zero hours. All right, at zero hours, I love that. All right, fertilization occurs. So this is the the starting point. Okay, Mr. Sperm has met Miss Egg. There's been an acrosomal reaction. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by that, the sperm cell releases acrosomes. These are enzymes that allow for it to penetrate the outer border or outer boundary of the egg. And what that does, as soon as it penetrates, it causes a granular reaction. And these granules are gonna form, granules, excuse me, are gonna form into what we know as our fertilization membrane. Why? One sperm cell per one egg, all right? And so as soon as it penetrates, it's creating a boundary so that no other additional sperm cells that are within the area can penetrate that outer boundary. Okay, all right. So at fertilization and then after 24 hours, up to 24 hours, that's when we start, we call it classify as a zygote. Okay, mitosis occurs. And you can see here, all right, once mitosis is occurring and it occurs rather quickly, we classify it as a cleavage. Where we see a split in the cells. And all of a sudden, we're gonna continually see mitosis occurring and occurring until we start to see a number of cells that are present. We refer to at about three days, this as a morula. Okay. So you're noticing here, we see here about I don't know, eight cells. Okay. From this point on, so 72 hours, we're three days. Mitosis continually occurs, continue occurs. So eight's gonna become 16, and 16's gonna become 32, and 32, 64. We're gonna continually see all this mitosis occurring until we see this big ball, this big spherical mass of cells that we refer to as a blastocyst. So basically from day four to let's say, they say, they say all the way up to like day 16, we're classified as a blastocyst until all these cells are big, this, this big spherical mass. And at day 16 or at two weeks, we start to see this spherical mass split into these three layers that we've been talking about, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. They're, they're already starting to form, all right, as far as this aspect has occurred. All right. Yes? So does it ever happen as a blastocyst that just passes? Like it doesn't, like, does it bind As far as implantation? Yeah. Yeah. It'll do that. And you wouldn't even know, like, when would it happen? No, they'll know. I mean, they may or may not know. They may think of it. It passes like a quote unquote heavy period of heavy menstruation, but usually should know, especially if you're trying. All right, this is why OBGYNs hate, hate the EPT test. Okay, we'll go back. She, since she brought it up, we'll get into it. All right, what's the hormone that we test for pregnancy for positive for to see that a woman is pregnant. It's got three letters. H, C, G. A human chorionic gonadotropin, okay? And the EPT test, okay, they test for it within, obviously, within urine. You pee on a stick, okay? And the EPT test is so sensitive that literally, Within 24 hours of fertilization occurring, we're still a flipping zygote here, okay? We can see the presence of HCG already. Has anything implanted? No. Oh. Is anything viable yet? No. Okay. So why do I bring that up? Yeah, is it possible at this point where we're seeing this that implantation has not properly occurred within that endometrial layer of the uterus? Yes. Okay. That's why an OBGYN will say, 
They'll call, you call and say, hey, I took a pee test. How long, you know, when was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Was the date of last menstrual period, you know, sexual activity, blah, blah, blah. They may ask those questions. And for the most part, they'll say, all right, I'll see you in six weeks. And you're sitting there going, no, I've got to get going. Is that why sometimes people see it as false positive? Correct. Okay. All right. Or not necessarily even false positives. It's just, it's, it's, it's just not, it's, it's not viable. Okay, it's not a viable, and, and at this point too, like, I hate to say this, to use the term miscarriage isn't even fair either yet either, because there was nothing that was being actually carried. Nothing had implanted. There's not usually false okay. positive though, it's just that you didn't become viable. Yeah, exactly, so, but what she's seeing here is, is the positive that was there with the and HCG the showed up, and then there's nothing that actually, yeah. So that's, to that end, yes, it is a false positive. Because what you're thinking of is when you see that HCG, you think, oh, I'm pregnant. And then, oh, and then unfortunately, sometimes that's, again, oh, it's all right. So for, unfortunately, that's when sometimes, again, people start to do, 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 And then, then, then all of a sudden, they're not. And then it's just like, well, what happened? And then you got a story to tell. And that's why they say, don't tell anybody. Shh, go. So um, basically, when the sperm is implanting the um, the egg. Okay, wrong term. Okay, penetrating. penetrating. Implanting would be is what the fertilized egg will do on the outer rim. So go ahead. Um, would it, like hormonal pills, like um, Plan B or something? What what does that process stop? Does it stop after it's been fertilized or before? Plan B is is almost starting and it's basically preventing implantation from occurring. So it's almost it's almost it's causing a shedding of that what we were talking about last week. That functional, that stratum functionalis. Mm -hmm. All right, it's basically preventing it so that implantation can't occur. Yeah. So it's almost basically, it's almost starting its own period. Yeah. Yep. Question, that stuff wasn't around. <laughs> is it, is it something like that, is there a situation where, or is there any concerns where somebody might take that, the morning after pill, whatever you want to call it, and then it does end up adhering and then there's issues or what's like what's the I'm sure there's cases of it I don't know I not likely I mean the odds of it are yeah I mean but at the same point does every medication always a hundred percent you know that's like hey it's it's funny if you ever sit there if you ever talk to like people like hey I used a condom did you ever read a box of condoms the per there's a it's a high percentage you're not gonna get pregnant that they're gonna work but there is that possibility, ever so slight, okay? Because I think they say that they're like, what? If, what do they say, the effective nature? I think it was like, I was gonna say 96, 97%. percent like, yeah. Does it like two to three percent? Well, and that is, you know, and then again, that is the whole point of it as it is a plan B. It was maybe, maybe birth control wasn't, was, was forgotten. Okay. Um, that's where I, you know, I've had patients with like, you know, with IUDs that have had issues with IUDs because the, they became pregnant on an IUD. I got pregnant No, again, I don't, take, I don't take it now. I have a kid, but it's shit happens. I mean, that's. <laughs> I don't think that's where that expression came from. But that's right. <laughs> um. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that was a good one. Um, no, but I mean, the reality of that was like my patient who you know, this was probably was this was two years ago. I know it was two years ago because she's since had us had a baby. All right. Um, She's in, she, she and her husband are newly married, and they weren't ready just yet. And so she was thinking, okay, I've got a little bit of time, blah, 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 because she's got you know, the IUD. She's on the bat, the birth control is already present. And because of it, it actually, it actually screwed up and didn't allow for proper implantation to occur. Okay. So she had to have it removed, and then it was just a whole big thing. But I mean, she's, I mean, they're okay now. It just, like you said. It takes six months for those hormones to cycle out of your body as well. It, it may take six months, but they were pregnant within, I think, two. 
Did you see the picture where the baby came out holding the IUD? How is that even possible? I didn't, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, again, these are. But like, doesn't the doctor check for that when you say you're pregnant? I, I don't know what the scenario was in that case. I'm, I would, I would hope. Yeah. I, I would hope. Not that, doctors are the smartest people. Yeah, and not only that. Wouldn't the woman know she had an IUD though? <laughs> you'd be surprised. You would, do you, you'd be surprised what patients don't report. You would be surprised how many patients don't go to regular doctor visits. You'd be surprised how many women okay. have having a child and didn't know they were pregnant. Yes. I hate that show. I mean, I know that sounds like crazy, but. No, it's not. very true. I know. I, hey, listen, especially like when you do, like, all right, so go back to this. Go back to this first flipping page that I showed you. This is in theory of what this female sexual cycle, this 28 day cycle. I'm not taking a poll in here, ladies, but how many of you in here could probably sit there and tell me that this is bullshit? Because 20, yeah, thank you. All right, because 28 days is in theory. That's a lot of this. That's like last week when I talked about you in, in theory, the climactic response of both male and female is supposed to happen simultaneously. That doesn't happen like that all the time. It doesn't happen like this. There are different factors. There's mitigating factors in every situation. Hey, if you're dealing with an athlete, okay? Female athletes, especially, okay? They're not, they generally don't have a normal regular menstrual cycle. And so, I, I, case in point, I have a friend whose girlfriend played college basketball, didn't know she was pregnant until she was six months pregnant. Because she never got a regular menstrual period. She never had it. She was always very tall female. So she, you know, so she always carried, she always thought, oh, I'm just putting a little more weight on and just, you know, whatever. But she was always active and working out and exercising. So she didn't even think twice. Happens. Okay. Let me get back to where I was. You guys are keeping <laughs> All right, so again, we're looking at the stages of prenatal development. So again, pre-embryonic, we had the four stages of zygote, morula, excuse me, cleavage, morula, blastocyst. Then from two weeks to two months, so from two weeks to eight weeks, we're classified then as all right, an embryo. Okay. From eight weeks to we say about 40 weeks, that's what we classify as a fetus. And again, I say about 40 weeks, because pregnancy doesn't necessarily have to occur at 40 weeks. Right. On average, from what I saw prior to what I read, prior to when, when I read all the updated what to expect when you're expecting. I got the new version of it, you know, with the updated version with my last son. Uh, and I read the whole book, which, you know, is in there. Is, um, 38 weeks is now the, the telltale point when uh, they will usually make a decision of, of either inducing or C-section, depending on what the states are. Back to my earlier statement to you was, again, call the doctor. The doctor, you know, I, oh, I took a test and again I you know it says that I'm pregnant doctors most of the time it's gonna say six weeks unless you're over 35 you've had previous miscarriages uh, or there is certain other health concerns based on previous existing conditions uh, and that will go into issues with um, different things as far as um, uh, well, certain things as far as like things like endometriosis, certain things as far as um, maybe they are on an IUD or was an IUD was implanted, things that they should be. Previous, well, that's again, previous, yeah, previous uh, situations, okay. All right, so again, eight weeks to 40 fetus. After delivery, up to six weeks, we classify as a neonate, okay. Up to six weeks, we classify as a neonate. I have an answer. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So if you have a um, answer might be no, or a I don't premature know. child. I know, like my first one was pretty early, and they're not considered. Um, like it's, what is it like? It's not a neonate. It's still not considered like until it's full term or whatever. And then, like, how does that work? Um, so he's still considered neonate because you know what are we, we're putting him in the in the, the neonate yeah the prenatal unit. So uh, it depends on where we're at as far as development goes. Um, you know, twins, perfect example. Twins are coming early. All right, twins are going to come at 36 sometimes, sometimes as early as 32 weeks. All right, why? There's no more room. Okay, so if we're, if we're doing, you know, multiple children, it's one thing. So again, you know, twins, triplets, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, the also, um, you know, what's going on conditionally as far as what's developed? Are the, lung, are the lungs developed? Are, I, guess uh, I guess what I meant is, are they, if they were like premature, they considered neonate past six weeks? No, it'll okay. just, it'll just, it'll no, go, yeah. I was okay. Yeah. No, it, it, because it, it, at that point, they're, it, it's what point organ systems are fully developed, survivable on their own. Okay. Um, great example was I sat there uh, in my MP1 lab at this point, and you guys who had me for MP1, we're doing the eye, the eye and the ear. And I'm talking to them, and I'm like, you do realize, like, it's not until like about 12 weeks that your children can actually, actually visually see you. You guys know that about babies, right? All right. They don't see you. They, oh, but the one woman said, my daughter looked at me. She may have been able to recognize the sound of your voice, feel the presence, and understand that you were there. She could not visually discern what she was looking at, okay, because those rods and cones hadn't developed yet. Okay. All right. And you'll start to see what's funny is like at like, three months, four months, when you look at, at, at newborns, you know, when they get to that stage, oftentimes they'll start to smile more. You'll see more, because they start to recognize shit. <laughs> They're sitting there going, oh, I see what, you, what I've been listening to for the last, you know, couple of months. All right, so it's, it's reactionary. All right, and you'll notice, sometimes you'll have, you'll see, if you've had like a, a two month old, the one eye's going one way, I'm going, oh God, is this child gonna be cross-eyed? What's going on? It's just because their focus isn't there yet. Okay, give it time to develop. All right. So is that why they tend not to use the flash on newborns? Yeah, well, the sensitivity to light, yeah, because we're still seeing development of, of all that. Is that why their eyes change colors after? Um, yeah, that, and we're, we're still seeing, we're still seeing, yeah, full development of the eye. Yeah. And, and actually pigmentation can change to not just within the eye, with hair color, okay? You know, so some, you know, I was, I was blonde haired when I was a baby, and I've got like dark, really dark brown, almost black hair now. Hopefully it's just not all turning gray. Um, but yeah, so different things. Let's get back. You guys can get me on point. Okay, 355. We're talking about the different membranes that will form upon fertilization. Okay. All right. Now, within this, all of these, again, developmentally, are going to become different things. Right? And so when we're looking at this, again, some of them are terms that you're already familiar with. Okay? I think you all know the amnion. Okay? Or you're at least familiar with amniotic fluid. Okay, and so the amnion itself, this is actually covering, all right, is the outer surface and surrounding, notice, the embryo. Now what happens, and what's really interesting, it says it surrounds the embryo, all right, and it's, it's there and it stays present even as we develop into the fetus, but one of the things that happens, and I, again, I know I mentioned this in my lectures, all right, is we see the formation or the development of that fine white hair, so we refer to as the lanugo of the fetus. And usually that occurs right around the fourth or fifth month. All right, so right around that second trimester. And you see this fine white hair, and again, sometimes with premature infants, it's not all the way shed yet, because it doesn't usually shed until about the eighth month, seventh or eighth month, all right? And the reason why is because this developing human being is submerged in fluid, okay? All right, and so things are processing through this fluid, but again, it's there to protect it, all right? Also that gets formed here is the yolk sac. 
I think what's really interesting about this is what's derived from the yolk sac later on. It develops into, notice it says the first gametes as well as your first blood cells. Okay. The next one also that forms here, the, out of the yolk sac, it's always fun to say because it's French, Alantoy. Yes, Alantoy. I don't know, I can't do the wee wee. I never took French. Okay. Uh, develops into what we know as the umbilical cord. Okay. And obviously, through the umbilical cord, we're seeing a lot of nutrition. Okay. All right. But we'll see through this and through the placenta. And actually, folks, placenta functions. Let's know. Write these down. Functions of the placenta. So I just mentioned nutrition. What else? What else does the placenta do? Well, we were said just said remove waste. How about excretion? Okay, folks. The 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 baby is once again once we start to see again in that embryonic stage, we're starting to see organ development. And once the kidneys form, the kidneys can function. Now, what they're swallowing, what they're processing is amniotic fluid, but they're functioning. And so we have to be able to remove that waste. Isn't that their too? Okay, so what we, what we use, what's, what if we said oxygen in, yes. carbon dioxide out, we use that term, yes. our term, yes. respiration. Okay, so another function of the placenta. So we see, all right, nutrition, excretory function, respiration. Okay, we'll go with that. And again, this is what we were talking about earlier. So you, so you said you had some effects from the, the prenatal vitamins, but also I said it's in response to probably pregnancy. pregnancy hormones. And within hormones, we don't just see hormones that are affecting, yes, they are affecting mom, but they're there to also affect the developing fetus. Okay, and so what we're seeing here is, you know, I mentioned human chorionic gonadotropin, and we're going to see here, all right, it talks about here, the next one we're going to see here is the chorion is the last of these fertilization membranes. All right, there's another one called human chorionic somatotropin. All right, and all of these human chorionic somatotropin allows for fetal protein synthesis. And then there's other ones that are going to allow for proper development of blood vessels. There's going to be a lot of ones that allow for glucose levels to, to have, be influenced within the infant. Why? Because, again, we just said we have to bring nutrition in, all right? And because of all this, we're having influence in growth and development. So, again, the placenta is now having an effect on endocrine function. Fourth one would be endocrine. Okay, so nutrition, excretory, okay, respiration, endocrine. Give me one last one, folks. Go ahead. Immune function, thank you. Doesn't it, if you drink it after you give birth, help with postpartum? Drink what? <laughs> I was going to say, what? <laughs> there are theories to that as far as some of the hormonal levels. It can, uh, you know, it, it, what's, it, what's really interesting about this is, and um, coming back to immune function real fast, and then I'll, I think I'm going to tie this all together. So um, when we talk about immunities and we talk about, I don't know if you guys, hopefully in your lectures, got into the lymphatic system a little bit, but this is the one aspect of natural passive immunity where we're seeing a natural development where antibodies are conferred from the mother to this now developing embryo slash fetus slash now neonate okay and going back to what she said this is one of the reasons why all right in most hospital settings they're trying to initiate breastfeeding almost instantaneously okay so they'll place all right infant on mother they want skin to skin contact because mother's antibodies are still present even here okay they're trying to get that newborn to latch as quickly as possible all right because even that even that initial colostrum that initial breastfeeding is it will allow for not only all right certain elements of nutrition, 
but for antibodies. That's why they always say breast milk is best because the mother's antibodies are present within the breast milk. And you've got this new human being that's exposed to a world where again, all of you heard me say this before, bacteria is everywhere. All right, and antigens are everywhere. All right, so mom, that element of, you know, of, of, of breast milk is allowing for conference of immunity. And that is one big factor will help with postpartum as well. Okay, all right, so it's another one. If they, if that's why another one, you know, if you guys have seen now, what do they have? They have lactation consultants and helplines and hotlines. I mean, they give us all this stuff. Listen, you, you I mean, literally, like when my son was born, we have a 1-800 number. I'm like, oh, well, really, do I have to call this? What's that? If you can't relax, if you're like all keyed up and you're in the hospital and you, correct. You, you, your milk yeah. won't drop. Oh, oh correct. But you ever, you ever, you know, the other thing that happens yeah. too is, is then you're sitting there and you're getting all these people that are going and we're putting pressure on you. What was that, Say it. Drink beer. Well, I used to fight with my nurse. My son wouldn't eat because he was naked and he was cold. Yeah. I used to fight with him. I left the hospital and he ate like that. Mm hmm. After, you, after everybody relaxed? Everybody has little unique little stories. And yeah, mm. she's not right. She's not lying either too on that other one. Beer. Beer will help with formation and development. Guinness. It's a good one. Exactly. Okay, have a nice Guinness. Huh? Yeah, with help with breast milk formation. It's, it's a Guinness. A beer or ten Guinness? No. And that's and that's that's the whole point. It's 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 aiding in the formation. But you know, dark beer is also antioxidant rich. So I think I've talked to you guys about that before. All right. All right. So again, we've got the functions there. We've got all right. This last one, Corion. Again, this is what we were talking about. This is this outer layer, all right, that is surrounding. And notice the Corion itself is going to develop into all these future blood vessels. So within each of these fertilization membranes that are surrounding, all right, they all have future functions as well. Okay. They're allowing for all this to occur. So again, typically when we looked at pregnancy, back to what we were talking about earlier, the three trimesters, right? There's 12 week periods, okay? And again, first one, most vulnerable, okay? What do we know about the second trimester? No, it's usually bad. Okay. It's, it's literally, it's that stable point for most, point, most people, okay? It's usually, you know, we're just, we check, we're watching growth rates, we're watching for development, Okay, we're making sure the fetus is, is properly forming, we're seeing proper organ formation. Okay, usually, all right, it's right at the end of the first trimester, early in the second trimester, that on, upon sonography we can discern gender, right? We can see, all right, all right. Um, they will, within these ultrasounds, also are looking at other things. What are other things that they may look at in, in, a, in a prenatal ultrasound, especially earlier on? Depends on blood work too. There may be like downs. What are they looking for? But what would they look at in the in the ultrasound that might correlate to downs? Well, you could have the thumbs are usually development. Okay, so they look. They look. They look. They look at the specifically though. They look at the nuchal ligament. They look at the neck, and they look at how thick it is, and they'll measure how thick it is. All right, and the thickening of that nuchal ligament within the neck is usually an indication of Down syndrome. Okay, of trisomy 21. All right. Um, what else? Anything else? How do people find out what they're having these days, like super early? Uh, the blood work itself will tell, can help to, I, you can, now they can do it, I think they can do the, the lab week as early as 10 weeks. People are finding out, like, right after they find out they're pregnant. Crazy. How do you wait till, like, 22 weeks? It's usually 10, it's usually 10 weeks. It's usually 10 weeks that the hormone is present. <laughs> Folks, yes, those are wives' tales. Those old wives' tales. Like, hey, if you have sex in this position, you're gonna have this, or you know, if, you know. All right, there are certain things. Now, um, there are certain positions that will aid in an element of fertility to aid spermatic movement, but I'm not gonna get into all that either. Okay, you guys can read on all those things as well. Um, as far as this goes, though. When we're looking at this, make sure we understand the stages and how they occur. Make sure we understand what's derived from each of these membranes, okay? All right, and the names of some of these different membranes because you'll probably see them on your test, okay? All right, 
That's it, folks. I've covered what I wanted to cover. All right. Any questions or anything else? I know you guys got some good topics. I like the I like the questions. Okay. Lab report is due next Thursday from midnight to 11:59 p.m. Okay. The quiz then will fall on the 19th. That's the last one. I don't have. A, I, we don't have a cumulative final. You gonna miss us or what? Hell yeah. <laughs> I get a, you know, this is my break. This is my t-shirt and jeans day. This is me not having to deal with